Deacon led me down more twisting passageways than seemed physically possible. The ruins of the asylum hadn't looked nearly this big on the outside. Eventually, the cells gave way to offices and storage closets, and an awful, incessant wailing proceeding into the background. We clambered across chipped gray bricks down a few narrow flights of stairs. I didn't like the idea of going further on the ground. It felt too much like, like descending into a tomb. But if there really was a way out down here, I could put aside a little claustrophobia and suck it up. Down here, Deacon said, leading me into a dimly lit basement. Just around the corner and ooh! He collided with a tall, lanky figure that had been crouching at the bottom of the stairs. Deacon only had time to let out a cry of surprise before the figure wrapped him in a pair of spindly arms and dragged him back into the darkness. Hey! I shouted, whipping the gun out of its holster. I clambered down the remaining steps and hurried into the depths of the basement. The figure had stopped by the wall and yanked the chains on the dust-covered light bulbs, spreading a pile of yellow wash over everything. In the light, I recognized the lanky figure as Dr. Renfield. One of his hands was holding Deacon's shoulders in a vice grip. The other held a scalpel to his throat. Both hands were flecked with tiny spots of blood. Shh, the doctor whispered as Deacon tried to struggle. Hush, boy. You made quite a mess upstairs. I had to get my hands dirty, picking up the pieces. You know how much I hate getting these hands dirty. Let him go, I barked. I lefted the revolver, but Renfield only tisked. A man in your condition shouldn't have a firearm, he said in that infuriatingly quiet voice. So unstable. You should put that away before things get even messier. It's too late, Deacon said in a strangled voice. The doctor lifted the scalpel to his Adam's apple, but the young man kept talking. You want to see a mess? Go outside. Find Sister Martha. She's probably just a spat on the ground by now. No picking up those pieces. The doctor tried to hide it, but I could see that he was visibly shaken, and the hand on Deacon's shoulder loosened just a touch. Deacon moved before I could. He elbowed Renfield in the ribs and threw his head back, bashing the doctor in the mouth. Renfield's grip slipped as he stumbled back, his free hand flying up to his broken jaw. Deacon took advantage of the distraction and clambered away, and I approached the doctor, who had backed up against the far wall of the basement. Up close, I could see past his thick glasses, and the eyes that stared down at me were a beady black, not orange. Renfield wasn't the brain sucker, not that it mattered. I lifted the revolver and placed the barrel in the center of his forehead. I can cure your madness, he said through his bloody teeth. I can fix you. Why won't you let me fix you? Every instinct in me wanted to plant a bullet in his skull. I compromised by bashing him across the head instead. Renfield hit the wall and slumped immediately. One pane of his glasses cracked. Curled up on the ground, he looked like a marionette doll after a child had dumped it unceremoniously in the corner. I found myself filled with a sudden surge of rage and disgust. So I sucked in a gob of saliva and spat into his scabby cheeks. Get over here, Deacon called from behind me. I've got the tunnel door open. I reholstered the gun and turned away from the fallen doctor. Deacon had wrestled open a great metal door at the far end of the basement, revealing another set of stairs that led down into a dark, dank tunnel. Even from here, I could smell the lovely odor of sewage wafting from below. Don't tell me how it looks, he said. Just help me navigate. I nodded, before realizing how pointless that was. Sure, I said. I took his arm and guided him down the stairs so that we stepped together into the wide, low passage. The place was lit up, but just barely, by the occasional electric light embedded in the ceiling. I've never been down here before, but I've heard that goods from town come up this way all the time. They must get out somewhere near the base of the mountain. Just keep heading downwards. You should eventually find the exit. Wish I had more than I should to go on that, I muttered. Deacon didn't reply. Really, what was there to say? So I helped guide his hand to the tunnel wall, and we started down the grimy stone path. The sound of the asylum had faded away to nothing over our heads, leaving only the thunk of our footsteps and a light dripping sound that always seemed to come from just up ahead. We walked, and we walked. Deacon, keeping his hands on the brick and the ground, continued to slope downward, and the stench grew stronger with each corner that we turned. Every so often I thought I saw a dark shape darting along the ceiling, and I would whip my head around, but if anything else was in here with us, it was faster than my eyes could catch. I was so focused on the scuttling little things that I didn't notice the low rumbling until we were several hundred feet in. It didn't stop, although I placed my own hand against the wall to feel the tremors. They were quiet, but 
getting steadily louder. Something was approaching us. How big do these tunnels get? I asked Deacon. Big enough to fit a truck through? Probably, he said. Some of the boxes they lug up here must be pretty big. Why do you ask? There's something I started to say, but I was cut off when the ground trembled so much it almost knocked me off my feet. I stood still and stared ahead. The stretch of tunnel ended up at an intersection a couple dozen feet away. The source of the noise was close, maybe just around the corner. Then a looming shadow emerged from the left-hand branch, and a horrific shape squeezed itself into view. I held my breath. Crawling on hands and knees, each movement heavy enough to send chunks falling from the ceiling, was the Wendigo Marconi had killed. Its globular mass of eyes spun and whirled, looking in every direction but mine. My heart leapt into my throat, and I flattened myself against the wall. I could hear each thump of my pulse as the being lumbered past the tunnel opening. Its bulky shape, so big, it scraped against the walls and ceiling. I sank to the floor and waited for the tremors to die down. Something crinkled in my pocket as I pressed against the wall, and I pulled it out into the light. Inspector's calling card. I fumbled for my lighter before realizing that the doctor must have confiscated it, and besides, did I really want to use that thing anyway? I folded the card in my fist and slipped it back in my pocket. Detective? Deacon asked. He stopped in place, tilting his head slightly like he was listening for vibrations. He turned and stared vacantly in my general direction. What are you doing on the floor? We have to keep moving. You don't feel that? I said. The rumbling? I don't feel anything. Come on. I rose to my feet. The Wendigo had vanished back into the tunnel, but the rumbling, though distant, still shook the pebbles around my feet. I watched them skitter for a bit, then looked up at Deacon. The guy was looking back at me, his milky blank eyes, his brow furrowed and confused. It's not real, I realized, and I felt like slapping myself. None of this shit's real. Deacon's slight frown grew more pronounced. What are you talking about? This whole time, I thought it was the doctor, I said. Because he touched my forehead, but you touched me too, didn't you? You grabbed my hand when we were escaping. That's, that's direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, and that's, that's all this thing needs to work its mojo. This thing? Deacon said. He took a step back, cautious, slight, but I saw it. I've been going crazy all day. Uh, watching things change and disappear in front of my eyes. Seeing a whole menagerie of old faces. <laughs> The Time Eater, that, that, that fucker on the radio, even the Christing Wendigo. But you know what? None of them are real. The only thing that's real is the brain sucker, and if I kill it, maybe, maybe I'll get my fucking brain back. Deacon's hands began to tremble. You're starting to scare me, Detective. Am I? I said. Good. Because I don't have sympathy for alien body squatters hiding behind a blind man's eyes. I pulled the revolver out of my holster slowly and thumbed the safety off. Deacon couldn't see what I was doing, but he heard the metal click, and his face went deeply pale. If you're still in there, Deacon, I'm sorry. But I can't let this thing escape. He turned tail to run, but the second bullet clipped him square in the back, just above his heart. He collapsed onto the tunnel floor. I lowered the smoking revolver an inch cautiously toward his slumped body. Blood seeped into the dirt around him, barely visible in the dim electric lights. With the tip of the gun, I lifted his arm and flipped the body onto its back. The milky eyes had stopped spinning. I waited for them to flare bright orange, for the creature inside to make its flight, but the seconds passed, and the body didn't stir. I wondered if I'd actually killed the thing after all, if it, if it was gone. If it was, wouldn't my madness be too? Then a slight draft blew through the tunnel, coming out of nowhere, and I felt something familiar tickle my hand. I looked down and saw that goddamn tag fluttering against my thumb. Lifting it up, I, I squinted at the tiny scribbled text. You get one shot. Burn in hell. No, 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 no. I fell back on my ass and let the revolver drop to the ground. Bulbs flickered overhead, and the tunnel rumbled with the Wendigo's distant footsteps. Inches away, Deacon's blood slowly turned the dirt brownish red. I sat and I watched as the dark tendrils seeped towards me like stretching fingers. Fuck. Oh, fuck, Deacon. I, I'm sorry. My bloody fingers were splitting into branches now, like, like some spiky subway map etched into the soil. I scrambled to my feet and snatched up the revolver. The footsteps thudded again, making the wall tremble. 
so I picked a direction at random and began to run. The tunnel arched around me, cold and chalky like a hollowed-out bone. My own footsteps thumped against the dirt, a second out of sync with my heartbeat. I'm not sure when I noticed the tunnel getting wider, but after a few minutes of running, it struck me suddenly that the electric lights were well over my head, when before I could have knocked my noggin against them. The walls, too, were farther away, and the bricks had given way to a smooth gray stone. When I was about to emerge in some sort of reservoir, I racked my brain trying to picture the geography of Mount Palmer, but the only map I could form in my head was that crisscross of blood spilling across the ground a few intersections back. I swallowed the image back and pressed onward. The lights soon grew so high that I could barely see where I was going. Each step was lit by a faint yellow glow, but just barely. Eventually, the way forward became so murky I had to slow my pace, which turned out to be a very good thing because I had rounded the next corner. The ground suddenly dropped away into a gaping chasm. I skated to a halt and threw myself backward to avoid tumbling over the edge. I hit the ground with an oof, and for a second, I thought I had conked my head, because I was literally seeing stars. But it wasn't just stars. It was moons and planets. Galaxies. Far away, but almost impossibly close, looming above me in a purplish, black abyss. My head throbbed as a large blue planet arced through the closest patch of darkness, its slender rings spinning like razor blades. I couldn't stare at it. It was, it was going to drive me absolutely crazy, so I pulled myself to my feet and I tried to run back the way I had come. But the second my foot touched down, the ground rippled like a pool of shallow water. I had a second to register this as weird, before the floor abruptly froze over and shattered into dusty fragments. I tripped backward, and the ground exploded at my step, sending dim shards in every direction. There was no sound, no, no spectacular crash, just the barest of whispers. Each step caused another shatter, and soon I was teetering above that purplish expanse of space. I had the barest of islands left, so I stayed utterly still, not even, not even daring to breathe. The revolver was like ice in my hand. I stood and I stared at the galaxies, swirling past my head. Another ringed planet spun in slow circles underneath me, its discs grooved like, a, like an old record, and shivered and clutched the gun and racked my brain for a course of action, but there was no up or down here, no plan of escape, just the, just the unending cosmos, the cosmos in me, a tiny molecule in the body of something much, much bigger. My head throbbed as something shifted in the cosmic vastness. The star slid aside, pushed by a shadowy hand. A vague outline appeared amidst the planets, larger than any of them, so large I couldn't even perceive its bottom. I'd been behind the rift and seen planetary-sized beings, but this new figure dwarfed them in comparison. It was galactic. Its eyes were clusters of purple stars. Wispy galaxies streamed from the area that must have been its mouth, almost like smoke from the universe's greatest cigar. The cosmic shadow shifted again. More of its form appeared in the blackness, a thin-brimmed hat. Lanky arms, a coat of rippling galaxies, descended into the abyss with no apparent end. Pain arced through my head, and I lifted the revolver with trembling hands. It's inside me, I realized. I'm the source of the madness. The brain sucker was inside me the entire time. I cocked the gun and placed the tip of the barrel against my temple. One shot left. One bullet. The brain sucker would be dead. One bullet in this mad universe would be destroyed. I didn't even care that I'd be going with it. I was diseased, and this was the only cure. Water trickled from the corners of my eyes. It dripped onto my lips, and my, my chapped tongue licked off the salt. One last taste of the world. One last taste before the lights went out. I slipped my finger against the trigger. Tighten my muscles. And a voice floated from the depths of space. A voice calling my name. A voice I knew. I froze. Cold metal still pressed against my temple. The universe bled away like dripping paint. A planet sagged. The galaxies faded out. A sea of dying fireflies. The cosmic shadows grew bleary and the edges... formed. Its form wobbled and changed. 
becoming smaller, a bit stouter. Weakness swept over me and I fell backwards, back into the abyss, except my back collided with a cold stone floor. The gun clattered out of my hands and probably flicked out of existence. Bricks folded out of space, enfolding me in four towering walls, broken only by a few windows and a single bright doorway. A familiar shadow stood on the threshold. I stared at it, my throat dry, my limbs numb and shaking ever so slightly. The shadow hurried forward and lifted its own gun, but it didn't point the thing at me. It swept the pistol around the room, peering into every corner. Then it lowered the gun and knelt down by my side. Hannigan, Marconi said. The fuck happened to you? I opened my mouth, but the only sound that came out was a dry rattle. The last I managed to rasp out, well, hello. I got him, Marconi said. Three bullets in the head. I don't know how you walked away from that crash, Hannigan, but Barlow was struggling to get out of the driver's seat when I plugged him. The guy was practically mashed against the windshield. I, I waited for some sort of slug to slither out of his ear, but I think... The brain-sucker monster thing inside of him was dead. He stuck out an arm and helped me up. I got unsteadily to my feet, staring around the empty room. The floor was littered with rubble and shattered glass. I was back in the ruins of Mount Palmer's insane asylum. Dizziness swept over me, and I grabbed onto Marconi's arm. She held me up and started guiding me towards the exit. How'd you get away from that mess anyway? She asked me. You got a little blood in your head, but I don't see a scratch anywhere on you. I swallowed back a painful lump and croaked out, long, long story. We emerged into the asylum's front lawn, which was overgrown with long blades of brown and grass. I looked to the left and my stomach turned. Barlow's car had sandwiched my cruiser against the outer wall of the building. My car was a crumpled mess and Barlow's, Barlow's issued a cloud of acrid black smoke from its exposed engine. Lester Barlow himself was slumped into the driver's seat with three punctured holes in his forehead. You're going to need a new car, Hannigan, the sheriff said. I didn't answer. If Marconi had killed the thing inside Barlow, then it hadn't followed me into the past after all? Then how could I explain all those objects appearing and disappearing, all those phantoms from my past rearing their ugly heads? Maybe I hadn't gone back in time at all. Maybe the whole thing had just happened in my head. Maybe the crash had knocked me into a pocket universe like the Wendigos, and my brain had populated the world as I, as I went along, complete with all sorts of glitches and echoes like a computer program gone bad. But the inspector would have known. But the inspector wasn't here. Narconi was talking again, something about paging the station to pick up Barlow's body, but I barely heard. I couldn't stop looking back at the crumpling ruins of the asylum. The skies and the present day were clear and cloudless, but the sun was starting to sink behind the towers, and it glinted off the glass in each shattered window. I stared at the gaping hole in the eastern tower and thought of Meg, Sister Martha, crashing through it. Had that really happened, and any of it? Marconi helped me into her cruiser and got behind the wheel. The car rumbled forward along the dirt path, but I was looking backwards still, back at the decrepit building and all its darkness. The screams of the insane had gone silent years ago. There was nothing but nature out here. Nature and its lurking, empty shell. A scar on the face of the mountain. The towers glowed a soft orange against the sun like a fire burning on the rooftop. I watched them for as long as I could. Then Marconi's cruiser plunged into the tree line, and the leaves blocked out the sky. Whatever remained of Mount Palmer Insane Asylum vanished into the murky past. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you for listening to tonight's video, and quite potentially tomorrow night's or last night's video, depending on how many times I've reused this recording. I especially want to give a big thanks to Eric Mary, John, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Frederick LaRue, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Alyasin, Tyler Ramberg, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Siegwert, Chempinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Andrea Solvik and Andrew Steinberg. You guys and everybody who is supporting on Patreon are the real MVPs. And if anyone would like to join them, you can always check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. 
Or if you'd just like to support the show without, you know, Patreon, then honestly, every view or minute or however you watch or listen to this creepypasta story time on the YouTube live stream or here on YouTube, the podcast on Amazon, Google Play, and on Spotify. And if you'd like to support my wife, then there's nothing better than listening to scary stories with some Dungeons & Dragons themed herbal teas. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle Tea. Alright kids, thanks so much for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>